Hey, I'm back. And this time with one of those kinds of stories, inspiring stories that makes you wonder about human potential. It's a conversation with David Katz, who was, is, has been legally blind since birth and rose to become one of the world's foremost photojournalists. Okay, I, let me just repeat that so it can sink in. He was legally blind and rose to became one of the world's, the top in the world in a profession that relies on eyesight. It's bonkers. So David's an incredible person and he lays out some of the struggles that he had to go through, but he did, he pulled it off. Like he, as he likes to say, there's no such thing as can't. And I'll include the links, um, areas where he's working. He's doing wonderful work to support people with physical disabilities. And as always, as I keep bringing more exciting conversations to you, please support the podcast by subscribing. All right, enjoy the conversation. He shared a post that you made on LinkedIn and I mean, obviously what it's just this uh, sorry to use the this isn't meant as a pun but it's very eye-catching that there is a you know in crude terms a, a, bl a blind photographer like that that's that's an oxymoron i suppose in in, in many ways so I was like, okay, I, I have to talk to this person like <laughs> what the hell is that about you know um but let's just sort of start from because we, we don't know one another so sure so first, first of all, thank you for, for the invite. <laughs> I, I'm very privileged of to, course, to be on. I know you're you're fairly, you know, you, you haven't been doing uh, the podcast fairly new, so I'm pleased to be on on the er in the early days. And uh, thank you for the invite, Kobe. And um, yeah, it's it, it's. I noticed as you said it, people are very careful how they word things. So in relation to to offending anybody, and you 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 worded it very well. There's, there's always a, a double entendre somewhere. But um, in relation to to the blind photographer, Avi was actually the one that gave me that name. I when when I brought my story out publicly six years ago, um, I was at a different stage then um, in relation to my, my own personal development and, and speaking publicly about my condition after all the years of not speaking about it. Why, and, why, um, why, did, you, why did you keep it private? Because I was a professional photographer. But, they, but had, people had seen... Okay, so, so why don't you just tell me, but uh, I suppose for everyone, anyone that's listening, your work included doing what? My, my press work? Yeah, sure. Well, when, when I became, I, I turned professional as a photographer um, at 19, just before my 20th birthday. And you were already blind then? So I was born with a visual impairment. At three months old, um, my grandmother noticed, uh, you can probably see my eyes move, yeah. which is an involuntary eye movement. It's called nystagmus. Okay. Um, nystagmus is not a condition. It's a symptom of a condition. So many people will have nystagmus, but for different reasons. Some people... It could be multiple cirrhosis. Some people, it could be a head injury. Some people just don't know. In my case, I have a condition called albinism, um, which is fairly familiar to, to most people when they think of albino kids or albino people in the street that have completely white hair yeah. and white skin. Yeah. And the condition, it's because you have a lack of pigments. Well, I actually have that condition. I just don't show... Uh, I have very fair skin that, that burns very easily and very sensitive, but I, I'm not white like um, sure. the, the regular albinos, but I do have the same condition. Also, your hair is... Uh... It's, well, my hair is, is kind of a reddish, yeah. um, reddish color, um, but it's not white. With, with right. when, when they show completely with albinism, you, you have like completely bright white hair it's very very easy or no or no, or no hair at all no no it's not not normally that's not normally an issue with that they and they normally mm. just have white hair okay. and very very white complexion okay and albinism um causes in my case the nystagmus and it also causes um it, again in my my particular case a very low level of eyesight so at three months old my grandmother noticed that my eyes were moving a little bit more than probably a, a, a baby should be it was the the end of 1966 there was no internet or anything like that and my parents um were recommended to see the leading eye doctor in the country at that time wait i'm just curious about your grandmother because that's super impressive that at three months she could spot something like that a grandmother <laughs> Did, did you have a, a relationship with her? Uh... Uh, very much so. We had a very close 
uh, family, have a very close family. Um, and yes, yeah, she, she noticed, she'd been, a, obviously she was a mother herself and she noticed that something wasn't quite right. That's and incredible. So they acted very quickly um, and um, they took me, there was a, a short procedure under anaesthetic because a baby can't really be tested without wow. that. Wow. And the professor, as he was at that time, told my parents, who were parents for the first time, that your son is blind, register him blind, and put him in a blind school. Those were his exact words. And when my mother said, but surely, he said, I'm a professor, don't tell me, I know this. Um, my mother went, my parents went to my mother's family doctor, um, afterwards and re relayed the story and uh, my mother's family doctor had been their family doctor since she was a child she was obviously very upset and they told he, he said to her doctors these were his words doctors are not God they don't know everything um, he said if we if, if you want to get one opinion two opinion three opinions we'll get as many opinions as we need to get to see and then We'll see what to do. Unfortunately, right. so he he took a, on them on that point, but then they they looked into everything and they took a lot of chances because they didn't know because I couldn't speak. I'm not completely blind, as in what they call black blind. That I have absolutely no sight. Even most people that have um, are, are registered as blind may have some sight or be able to right. see some colours or something like that. And your eyes. I mean, except for the some of the movements sometimes look like anybody else's eyes that I can uh, identify. I exactly. Mean, so, right? so people people didn't know and don't know. Yeah. Um, and and even in the beginning, the doctors didn't know for sure. It was only as I got a bit older and I was tested all the time, but they they learned that I, I did have um, what what in in those days in in London in England was called legally blind, mm. and the, uh, as little enough sight to be registered as blind my parents never registered me which which i'm pleased about and i never registered until the last eight years because they wanted me and and then when i was old enough wanted me to to have as regular life as possible wow. um so it was very brave i mean you're a parent yourself you know what it's like in in every situation with young kids yeah um that they, they they know that their kids got very poor eyesight and and has got eyes that move that that um that people can notice about that and they put me into a regular school and we did everything normally which i thank god for every day and and i thank my parents for every every day for that because that that led me to have the kind of life that i had they weren't in any kind of denial if if i wouldn't have been able to cope in in that school or, or in those conditions which wasn't easy by a long way they would have pulled me out but they wanted to give me every opportunity and together with my personality that's what developed so what what can you see what what what, what when you open your eyes what happens so to give people an idea because um, I, I didn't think of it until I made my story public and was starting to think about what people are going to ask me and then I started to get asked. So I hadn't really thought about it because I didn't really think about what other people saw. Sure. You know, I, I, when I was young, I thought everybody saw like me. And then, then right. as I got a little bit older, like seven, eight, nine, I realized that I couldn't see as well as others. And I had other issues with depth perception and light perception and different things. Um, but um, it's difficult to do it exactly this way, but to, most people are familiar with going into an optometrist or a high street place to have their eyes tested. Okay. And you sit in a small room with an eye chart with letters on and a light yep. on it, right? Yep. So in my case, um, obviously I was brought up on those things for as young as I can remember, but to, to give people an idea, um, when I'm asked to put my hand over my left eye, I can see a light on the, the machine. I can't see any of the letters. I can see shapes, but I can't make out any of the letters. You can see the black colors of the no. letters? No, well, just yeah. about. I can see the light if there's a light on it. Okay. Um, I, I can make out that it's a chart. And, and it doesn't matter how big the letters are or how small? On my right eye, at that distance... If, if the letters were, if the top letter was absolutely huge, I might be able to see it. Wow. Um, okay. If my right eye is covered, I can see the top, usually see the top letter. Okay. 
but that's it. Okay. Um, and then there's the issue which comes with my specific condition and conditions like it is that it's variable because it can change. So it's like I said to you before in relation to the light coming in. If I'm looking into bright light, it will make me tired and fatigued very mm -hmm. quickly. Mm. So um, the, if I'm looking at letters on a board for a few seconds, it will rapidly start to get smaller and fuzzier. And then there's the issue, um, because it's not all about just how far you can see, it's how you see. And, and in relation to my condition, um, there's added conditions that go with it that affect the way I judge distance. I'm not really able to see distance. I'm not really able to judge depth perception. And I have issues with contrast and, and light sensitivity this is crazy. all good things kobe that help you become a top photographer and i was gonna say I, that, <laughs> the, this seems like elementary stuff in order to point a camera at something capture not just an image but also a message right which is precisely what you were doing right yes yeah. as, as photographing people in positions of power or fame or what and like they're human beings but they're also symbols in a way and you're out there capturing this stuff and without all the the sort of god-given tools that any person or most people any certainly photographers have and you're doing that as well that's crazy that's crazy wait wait okay so you said around seven eight years old you started to notice that your vision is different from the other kids do you remember that that realization, that moment where you said, yeah. oh, wow, that's... Yeah. Uh, I, look, I knew from a very small age because I knew that I was going to a hospital on a regular basis for a lot of mm. checkups and a lot of doctors and specialists and professors at okay. a high level. Okay. So I didn't know any different. And, and I was under a wonderful hospital, which is very famous, called Great Ormond Street in London, which is the hospital okay. for sick children. Um but then going to school at five years old, and I was only just five when I started school, you know, you're not really doing so much stuff that um, you're mostly playing, or certainly that was what it was like when yeah. I was at school in the very early 70s. So it was only when I was seven <laughs> years old that suddenly you're... Um, the teacher is writing things on the blackboard. You can't see the blackboard. Right. You're having to share books. can't see a book to share have to hold the thing very close the main giveaway was obviously what you can see is that my eyes moved and kids at that age are starting to recognize yeah. whereas before that they right. don't really notice right everybody's the same then they notice and it's like well why are you different why are your eyes wobbling why and and some kids would well at that point it was mostly in a in a way of making fun of because they didn't sure. really understand right. to ask the teachers were aware but I knew I couldn't see the board without having to go close and I knew I was struggling and that was the point where I actually um I was actually in denial because I was getting so much um uh, there, there, there was a lot of comments about my eyes and I just wanted to be like everybody else I didn't want to be any different right and I said you know to, I was going home very upset and I was starting to you know to get into trouble a little bit with things um and um I always sat or laid right next to the television because I couldn't see it from the couch wow so I was said to my parents and my mother in particular um I don't have anything wrong with my eyes there's nothing wrong with my eyes so she said okay so she said Come sit on the couch and watch TV on the couch. Okay. Greatest advert for tough love that affected her <laughs> for the rest of her life that she did to me. But it was the greatest thing, hardest thing she ever did, but the, the most amazing thing for me. Yeah. Um, so but what you happened? know what you know what makes that okay? I mean, is that... From what I, from what I can tell from what you, the story that you've already told so far is that your parents said... We're not going to register you as blind. You're going to lead a dignified, a life of dignity. Give, you know, in spite of your condition. But you have to face facts. But no matter what, you're still a whole person, and you can lead a life of meaning and purpose and dignity. So it's like you come sit on the couch. I'm going to smack you in the face with some truth, but also. Don't let that stop you, right? Like there's like both messages in that one story from from your mother. It's um, it's pretty touching. I mean, the way I read it, anyway. So so yeah, listen. As a as a 
listening to that story now and relaying it, that's exactly the way you would relay it. But you've got to remember, this was the early 70s. It was a different language and a different way mm. of speaking. And um, th it wasn't done this way. It was like, you, you know, you got on with it. Right. You got on with it. And, and um, what, she, what she said was, uh, I, I couldn't see the television. So I sat on the floor in front of the couch. And yeah. I was gradually getting closer <laughs> to the television. And she said, why are you not on the couch? And I said, because I can't see the television. And that was the point. And, she, and, that was, and, and this was the difference between the, the language of then and now. Is that she said to me... Um, because I, I, I said, I, I don't know if I can do this. I can't do it. I can't do this. And she said to me, David, there's no such word as can't. And that's where that comes from. And that's how I've led wow. my life. The kind of the, 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 the terms that you're using are terms today, which are great terms, and have come as, um, as a learning curve from those days where it was the other way. It was the other way. Yeah. You were... You know, it's gone from one side to the other side now. That's so, incredible. Yeah. Wow. But, and how, what was your father like? I mean, your mom, obviously, was, she sounds like a, like a badass, but how was your dad? They were both badasses in their own way, <laughs> just okay. different. Um, he, so she, she was incredibly um, everything in relation to medical and, and, and like the doctors and that side of it. My dad was more on the spiritual side of things so he mm. he took me to to spiritual healing which now they have a very nice name for like reiki and things like that that everybody does is very fashionable in those days uh, a jewish kid going into church halls with all the spiritualists and faith healers putting hands on was incredible and it helped me dramatically really? it gave me an understanding of alternative uh, roots of, of doing things. There's there's not just one way of doing things. Like, wait, like what? Because uh, I, 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 I know nothing about any of this stuff. So like what? So, so back back then, um, uh, you know, I, I would have issues with strain, and when my um, when I was tired or when I was sick or when um, I was upset, my eyes would move more. Um, okay. Which would then have a knock on effect on my sight. So, okay. you know. The doctors in the hospitals weren't really able to 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 do anything except come back in in six months, and I was basically a case study, which is a, a lot of that situation, mm. um, which was okay. You know, they they've got to learn, and hopefully, they're going to learn to help others going forward. Right, but you're a person as well. Um, correct, which yeah. was only that only happened with one doctor when I was 11 years old. Um, who, who helped change my life with that. But, but in those early years, both my parents were incredible in, in the way that they dealt with it. You know, so in relation to that, we went to um, uh, spiritual healing, um, which helped dramatically. It, it gives you a sense of um, calmness and um, a sense of well-being of, of people giving love. And um, it opened me up to other alternatives f throughout the course of my life. And what I show to, to kids and parents of kids now when, when I yeah. made my story public is things that I've learned through what my parents did and then through what I've learned to try and manage the condition as best as possible. And how old were you when you started doing these so-called alternative spiritual therapies? So um, it, it wasn't... It's, I, I think the wording is wrong there in relation to so-called alternative spiritual therapy. It was, it was healing. It, it, was, yeah. it was a very well-known practice that some people um, used to believe in very dramatically and other people didn't believe in it, but they didn't necessarily yeah. not yeah. believe in it. It's not any kind of woo-hoo. It um, it's been around for, for thousands of years and it was something that, helped me personally dramatically and, and as my life progressed and I started to, to, to use my knowledge from experience to help others, I looked at other ways because there's not just one way, Kobe, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the doctor, when I was three months old, said he's blind, put him in a blind school. Well, that was one way. Yeah. But there was also other ways. So there's also you, you go to a doctor and the doctor says, for some people, glasses work. For some people, um, certain other techniques work. For some people, 
what they refer to as more alternative, which are actually more the original actual uses of treatment long before yeah. the, 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 the forms of treatment that became more popular in more recent years. I mean, I, I, I fully agree with you that the world as we experience it, right, or, or, or the, the, the way that we interpret the world is, is, is what we manifest, right? If we think that people are evil and they're out to get you and all, like, that's the world you're going to inhabit. Whereas if you have a, have a much more, let's say, benevolent view or optimistic view of things, you tend to then focus on those things and, and that is the world that opens up, opens itself up to you. Now, I'm not saying that that is the world, the way the world is always, but as far as, uh, this is just what I believe, that um, if you're, if you, if you view the world in that way, then most probably the majority of your life is going to unfold in that manner. And, and what's so cool about your stories, certainly about your parents, and you're calling them both badasses in their own ways, like they helped you, a, your mom saying, you know, keep a stiff upper lip, uh, but you can, you can, you can do what you, you can live a good life. And then your father saying, sure. And now we just have to sort of frame your mindset in a way that what you project out into the world is going to be exactly what mom is saying, right? Um, they, that's 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 really cool. Like you get it from both from both angles, right? That's very very lucky, Kobe. My life would have been yeah. very different. Yeah. I mean, it, it obviously. My, my own personality as it developed played a part in, in, in it as well. Yeah. But um, look, you know, those, especially those first three years, the first seven years, they're the formative years in every child's life development. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's not to say it was easy, but they, they, were, they were both incredibly loving and they both had their different ways of doing it, yeah. which, which led on to me. And, and they both believe very strongly in relation to my eye condition uh, and this is something i pass on all the time now that it's not how far you can see it's what you see mm. so and so this is when people say to me well how did you become a photographer well um eyesight is how far you can see so when we spoke about the chart before that judges how far someone's eyesight is yeah. or what they can read at a certain distance or reading a number plate yeah there are people that have the most incredible eyesight that they can see for miles ahead but they don't actually see anything around them what's going on that's vision mm. so for me there's a huge difference between eyesight and vision eyesight is what you see vision is what it, is uh, sorry eyesight is how far you can see vision is what you see mm -hmm. what we see and they believed very strongly instead of concentrating and listening to a lot of what the maybe the doctors were saying and other people were saying at the time put him in a blind school he's going to struggle in every situation right. thank god they never had the internet at, at that point yeah um because it would have said when you type in the condition he'll never drive he'll have trouble being uh, in a social situation he'll never work properly you know can't 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 well what can you do that was one of the reasons right. why i wanted to show when i made my story public what someone with this condition can do because it's amazing. when a parent puts into google at uh, now they'll see all those negative reports but they'll also see there was a guy called david katz who went on to become a, an internationally acclaimed photographer it's not <laughs> necessarily everybody's going to do that but it's what can be done and in those formative years m my parents encouraged me uh, and i didn't really know any different at a certain point which was hard when i did make the story public to learn how to actually be blind yeah um, yeah, but, yeah but they had a, a wonderful philosophy and a very brave philosophy in relation to um it's not what you can't use use what you can see concentrate on what you can do not what you can't right, do right 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 because the things that we cannot do and this this applies to everyone is i mean that list is so much longer than the things that we can do and yet people do extraordinary things right so I mean, th there is there is a point in, in there is wisdom, in, in fact, in what you say, right? Which is really to focus on on the on what you can do and your skills and your talents and, and so on. So, okay, so as a kid, you had this kind of support behind you, and you were going through this uh, the healings, right? It, and how how were you as a kid? I mean, did you did you have friends? Did you like just tell me your? I uh, yeah, I I I had. Um 
friends. I had a good group of friends. I, I tried to fit in. I loved football. Um, you played. So you played football. I played every all sport. No um, way! Wow. Um, uh, I even boxed. <laughs> yeah. No. So yeah, I because again, no such word as can't. Um, wow. So. Um, Wait, you you actually got in a ring and sparred? Yes. Yeah, there's pictures. Wow. Of it. Yeah. Oh no, I didn't God. spar. I, ah. I did spar in the lead up to the to the fight, but I actually got into a boxing ring in an arena, and 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 fought. I did it um, for my uh, my fortieth birthday because that was something I was stopped doing as a child because of the the the. the difficulties in getting hurt and people giving you permission and people didn't Whoa. want to take the responsibility something i felt i could do and wanted to do and they the people that organized the boxing didn't know and my story wasn't public i knew my story was going to be public at some point um and it was something else i'd always wanted to do because that was probably the one thing i was stopped from doing as a child because i did want to box and 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 my parents rightly and particularly my father who who had actually been a very good amateur boxer himself said no that's you you're not getting in a boxing ring. Um, <laughs> wow. So, so yeah, I did that. But wait, 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 wait. You, you have poor depth perception, mm. and you got into a boxing ring. <laughs> Man, you're you're an animal. How 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 did you fare? How did I fare? Um, well, the guy was um, twenty eight pounds heavier than me, <laughs> about three inches. So um, he. I fared actually quite good because I should have been knocked out the ring into about row 32. <laughs> and uh, the fight was stopped in the second round out of three. And uh, the, the referee couldn't believe that I still wanted to continue. Um, so, Do you know if you landed some punches? I do. Of course I landed some punches. And, yeah. and so did he. It's a fight. But it's, it's Incredible. The, the issue. But look, there, there's a, the, the, one of the most famous boxers of all time. Uh, Joe Frazier yeah. also fought with one eye and that's why he fought the style that he fought that right. he was always in close um, oh, and yeah. he had to take a lot more punches because he couldn't see punches coming from one side Jesus so yeah right. people didn't know that that was that was the Ali fight right? if I'm well not... he, yeah he fought Ali uh, three times Right, right, Joe, right. Joe Frazier was a heavyweight champion of the right. world and one of the all-time great heavyweight boxers. Right. And he lost an eye in the very early stages of his amateur boxing career. Oh. And he never, or he lost a sight in one I eye. thought this was only for one, for one fight. No, no, they lose, they get hit all the time that they lose, that it goes blurry. Or, no, he, he, he didn't have sight in one eye. So oh, in wow. relation to, to that situation for me, um, you know, I'm close to the guy, so I can That's, see the guy, okay. but I can't, judge i can't see quickly enough punches coming in from that side right, so i have right. to stand in a certain way and move a lot um and um but it, it wasn't about fighting it was about stepping through those ropes no 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 hey listen i i i i have never done that and i probably never will but uh that's that's a hell of a courageous thing to do no seriously i all, all, all um, more power to you, man. Um, no, it's, it's, it's showing what can be done if you yeah. want to do it. And also, I needed, you know, I, I like to test myself to prove certain things to myself. I was coming up to 40. Um, I'd photographed a lot of boxing. I loved boxing. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was a sports photographer at the highest level of, of national uh, journalism when I was in my early 20s. What kind of fights did you... Um... World title, like big, big big fights like, did you have to fly around the world for for these things or uh, i i did i one time i was um uh the official photographer for a heavyweight boxer that um meant me going to uh, monaco with him a couple of times for fights where he fought in monaco um but i covered sport generally when i started my career i was a sports photographer which again wow. you know that's the hardest thing you can actually choose to do with with a visual impairment <laughs> you know maybe you know if I would have, it would have been easier to put a camera in this kind of situation, a one-on-one -on -one and yeah. sports photography. Most, most photographers who cover all the other things can't cover sports photography, but they're still professional photographers. Wh why is that? Because sport is very, very fast. You have to, you can't be close to it certainly not with professional sport you have to use very long lenses and i started in the days the real days of photography before autofocus and auto automatic cameras mm. and photoshop mm -hmm. you had to know how to use a camera manually and to focus it manually 
Um, and again, it was like people would say to me now, if I made my story public, that I'd, that I'd only been working as a photographer for, say, 15 years. They'd say, oh, it was all the autofocus. Well, I made my <laughs> name as a photographer uh, long before autofocus was ever thought about. Man, your story just keeps on getting more incredible. It's, okay, so how did you... How did you um you said you started at 19, so you didn't go, uni did you go to university? Or no. You? No. How come? How come? Because I had no academic I interest and, and, you know, I struggled in a, in a most, unless I really loved the subject, um, I struggled in most subjects okay. because it was hard for me, you right, know. Right, right, right. Um, it was a struggle to write. It was a struggle to see the board. Oh, um, yeah. And if I wasn't motivated... And it was difficult to keep up in, in certain things. Yeah. So I was never going to university. So did you, whatever, whatever things that you did learn was purely oral and, and via memory? Or? Correct. So, so wow. and you'll find that most, most visually impaired um, kids develop or have the most incredible memory. Um, and and, and I, I did, you know, I'll tell you something funny in a second uh, as we spoke about... Um, the charts in the, the, the offices of the doctors. Yeah, yeah. Um, but what's, what's harder now is getting older. My, my long-term memory is still amazing. But right. My short-term memory is terrible. <laughs> so it, it's harder now, actually, in some respects, because I could memorize everything. When I learned my bar mitzvah, I learned my bar mitzvah off by heart from a tape recorder over right. the course of a year to right. learn how to, to say it. But what I used to do in the times bef when I didn't like to, the doctors to see how bad my eyes were, mm -hmm. I would go into the office through the door and take a look at the chart as I was close to it um, at the doorway and then walk in and remember the first three or four <laughs> rows of letters. And, and I would, wow, David, that's actually better than we thought. And I'm like, you're only conning yourself by doing that but I was I was seven eight years old um but but then they they I, th I don't know if they cottoned onto it or they just had this thing where sometimes it was four-sided so they would change it around and it was like okay that was I don't know that one so I'd so but yeah it was all, all coping mechanisms Kobe right, you right, develop right, right. many many coping mechanisms yeah. it's amazing uh but did you and do you did you do um did you create these systems of learning on your own? Is there something that you uh, developed as time went on? Someone taught you these things? Like how? So no one taught me anything <laughs> in relation to as it is then and as it was now. Yeah. My parents, they, just, they never knew. We, it was as we went along. Right. When I was about, and again, you know, back in those days, and, and it's, it's not brilliantly better now, but it's better than it was. In those days, there was no support systems. There was no social media. There was no internet. Yeah, yeah. There was no real or very, very few doctors would actually treat you as a human being and, or, or, or you would meet someone else with a similar condition. Yeah. Right. To yeah. talk to. Yeah. That just didn't happen. Um, and when I was about, again, a very formative seven years old eight years old there's a very famous chat show in in england uh well, it's worldwide but uh, it originates from england parkinson michael parkinson is a very famous interviewer um had all the the biggest stars on for many years um and michael parkinson had a young musician on called as in those days he was james galway now he's sir james galway James Galway was, even then, which was the early 70s, the greatest flutist in the world and one of the top musicians in the world. Okay. And I remember it was a Saturday night. I was, uh, I was already in bed. My parents were downstairs. I wasn't asleep yet. And I could hear activity, like, like call him, get, get. And, so, and they, they come down, which was quite rare because I was always begging to come down for the later thing, which was match of the day to watch football and they wouldn't let me at that age. <laughs> so it's like, why are they bringing me down? They brought me down and they said, look, look at this guy's eyes. And his eyes were exactly the same as mine. I've wow. never seen anything like it. They were moving side by side really fast. And it's very hard for someone with this condition to actually see it sure. in someone else sure. for some reason. Right. Um, and I watched the way he held his head and he held his head in a way 
which I didn't really understand at that point, but I copied him. And, and it turned out, and I don't think he even knew it, and I had the privilege of interviewing him in a, in a podcast situation, just like we're doing, where wow. I interviewed him and told him... He's still alive. He's still alive. He's, he's in his 80s now. He lives in Switzerland, but he's still the, the number one flutist in the world. Wow. And um, he never spoke about the condition all the years. And the first time he ever spoke about the condition was to me on my podcast mm -hmm. uh, about a year and a half ago. But so we watched... I watched him, the way he held his... And, he was doing two things. He was, first of all, for cosmetic reasons, he was trying for the cameras not to pick up the fact that his eyes were moving. So instead of looking straight down the camera, which you would do, most people would do, yeah. he kept moving his head. And because he played the flute, he was able to do that in, a, in an easy way. And also... It's because there's a name for it, which I discovered myself when I looked into it... 10 years ago yeah. it's called the null position so anybody with an astagmus or with this condition there's a best position for seeing the maximum that you can see it doesn't mean you see well or you see better but mm -hmm. there's a position and this was why when i came in i wanted to sit in a yep. certain way yep. to you there's a position that i can have i can see in the best way possible with my condition that will give me the maximum amount of time without being fatigued. And I learned that by watching how he held his head. Okay. And he actually, when I spoke to him about it last year, he didn't actually realize he was even doing it. Um, but I learned this and I'm able to, as a result, to pass on my knowledge to kids and the parents of the kids yeah. to say, you know, there's more information now, Kobe, about it on the internet. Yeah. But... Still, a lot of people find out the hard way. It's like, well, what can we do? You can't cure the condition. Yeah. But what you can do is try and manage it the best way you can to yeah. make it um, the best it can be. And, and that's where my, my knowledge that I've learned and the things that I've achieved and also my upbringing in relation to working with medical doctors and eye doctors and also working around alternative methods sure. which you know led to things like um uh, uh chiropractic adjustments and and pilates and acupuncture and things like that that people are using more and more that help with these conditions um to manage them and and these are all things i've used myself the doctors use me as a lab rat. i might as well have used myself <laughs> which i did yeah. so i've learned how to help myself but i've also yeah. learned techniques that i've that I use, that I wanted to use to, to pass on to others. Okay, so, so let's, um, let's talk about you as a photographer. I mean, do, do you remember the first time you picked up a camera? What, how, did this, how did the love affair begin? Uh, it's very well put, Kobe, because it, it was a love affair. That's a very good term. Um, I came to, well, my parents brought us to Israel for the first time um, in 1974, a few months after the Yom Kippur War when I was seven years old. Okay. And my dad had uh, one of those old type cameras. It was called the Ilford Sportsman. I still have it at home. Is this a Polaroid? or this? No, is... it's not a Polaroid. It's, a, it's just an old type, you know, click type, 35 millimeter film camera. And how many pictures on each roll? Oh, in see? those days, you could get 36, 24 or 12. Okay. And it was my dad's camera and I drove him crazy. <laughs> I want to take a picture. I want to take a picture. And my dad being my dad, like didn't think anything of it to, really? to give it to a blank. And the first time wow. we ever went to the Western Wall, um, and I've still got the picture to this day, I took the camera away and I went and photographed a soldier. And I fell in love with it, Kobe. And Why? What, what about it? Tell me about it. Because I saw things in a different way. So with my condition, and I only learned this in more recent years specifically, um, but it goes back to then. Part of my condition is that my, the, the neurological side in my brain can't cope with the amount of information that's coming in mm. that it's got to try and calculate and okay. collaborate. So it's a bit fast. It means I can feel dizzy, off balance um, be because of 
um, my, my brain is always trying to catch up with too much information. Okay, okay. When you put a camera, and, and, and now I watch them, it's funny because the phone, they, they, they hold it at a distance, or even with cameras now, they don't look through the viewfinder anymore. But when with the old-fashioned cameras, you used to put it to your yep. eye and look through the viewfinder. Yep. That small square cuts out everything else around except oh. what I want to be looking at. Um, and I... Always, from a very young age, I had friends that could draw really well. And I could see things in my head, how I wanted them to look and, and how I imagined them. And um, visualisation, which is what they'll call it now. Um, but the way I would be able to manifest it was not through drawing. And I don't know if that was because... I don't think it was because I had a problem with my eyes that I couldn't draw. I just Some people have that gift, yeah. some people don't. Right. When I picked up a camera... I could capture what I wanted to capture, and oh, I loved wow. it. And um, so throughout the, the years between 7 and 16, um, every few years I'd ask my parents to buy me a camera. So, uh, and I was the class photographer because I was the only kid who had a camera. And the teacher was, was that really good teacher that, that actually thought, you know what, no such word as can't, let him do it. And I did it. And that gave me confidence as well to know that I could do something that the other kids right. couldn't do, or at least I could do my own thing as well as they could do. So in, in, some, in some weird way, your condition made you sort of maximally prepared or, or built to be a photographer. Like if your, your brain can only handle so much, but yet when, when you're, when, when the vision, when the field of vision is so limited that you can hyper focus, and then you know exactly what you want to see, that is the camera cu coupled with you, and then you're out there documenting the world. So, I would say that a camera is a tool. A camera is only an extension of the person behind right. it. Right. So. The camera's not doing it for me. I'm telling the camera what to do. This is the difference with the modern cameras, is they can literally go off and make the tea. Um, the, the cameras that I grew up with and that I still would use a camera in that way, yeah. I'm, I'm telling the camera what I want it to do. Okay, I'm using wow. the camera as a tool. And in relation to the wording that you used, I don't see it as a weird um, thing. The, 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 the situation with the camera made me everything that I am today. It taught me everything that I never learned from doctors or anybody else at that point. It taught me everything about my eye condition and it pushed me further than and made me a better, much better photographer than I would have been if I would have been a photographer at all, if I hadn't had an eye condition. Isn't that crazy? That's wild. I'd see, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? That's yeah. where you, you look to, to other things. It's like, well, why have I got this gift? What have I got this gift for? I shouldn't really be able to do this, but I can. Yeah. And not only can I do it, I can do it to a level that is higher than most people with good eyesight. And it's okay. So, right. So what... Uh, so how can I give back? Wait, so so in that I just want to go back to that picture sure. in, the, in the Western Wall of the soldier. Yeah. Do you remember what you were trying to tell the camera to do? I, I wanted to show the cat the, the the I wanted to show through the picture how I saw the soldier, and that's the same way that I photograph anything now. Mm. You know, it doesn't matter whether I'm photographing. You know, last a couple of weeks ago, I went back into that world. Someone asked me they they needed a picture done that was. Um, was a very difficult picture to yeah. get under the circumstances. Dame Helen Mirren was here okay. um, in Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Film Festival because uh, she's playing Golda Meir in a okay. film coming out in August. And um, I went in. I knew the picture that I needed to get, and I was asked, even now they know that I have the eye condition, David, you're, this is a really difficult picture. We, we know most people won't be able to, to get that image. So I knew in my head, and, and then I, I... And there's a very... One of the, the, the people that I look up to as a, as a photojournalist, which is what my first love was, mm -hmm. reportage photojournalism style photography, mm -hmm. um, a guy called Henry Cartier-Bresson, who's one of the most famous photojournalists, uh, or was... And he said the, the camera is an extension of 
um, the eye, the finger, and the heart. The eye, the heart, and the finger. Okay. So you're visualizing. And what I was always able to do was see things as a picture. And what made me uh, an even better action photographer was... I was able to anticipate what was going to happen before it happened oh, photographically. Wow. Okay. Which, because when you're taking a picture, Kobe, if you've seen it in the viewfinder and not pressed, you've missed the picture. You have to actually press a fraction before it actually unravels. So you're oh, kind wow. of anticipating in relation to... Um, to that kind of action photography, which was the style that I loved. Wow. So I visualize, I know what, what in my mind makes a picture, what I want to try and get. It's like witnessing history before it actually yeah. happens. Well, yeah, but a lot of people can have that ability in different ways. I just am able to express that through, my, through the camera. But, but people forget, and especially the kids now, they, you know, with Photoshop and with, with everything being autofocus and, and AI, is they forget that these are tools. You know, they're, they're tools. You, yeah, yeah. you know, you don't tell it what, you, you don't let it tell you what to do. Yeah. You tell it what to do. And there are times when in certain circumstances, you can rely on it to, to be able just to shoot a really quick picture when you haven't got time mm. to do all the technical stuff. Mm -hmm. But that can be hit and miss because the camera's only can, um, programmed to work in certain conditions by itself with its own memory. So certain conditions will fall it. So unless you know what you're doing as the person operating it and behind it, okay. um, the camera can, can do some misleading things with exposure. But basically what my, what my photographs are showing is how I see life and capture in a moment. I love this. So what separates, you said this, the cameras are tools and all these amazing developments are tools, but you have to know what you're doing. Right. So what separates someone who knows what they're doing versus someone who doesn't know what they're doing? Experience and practice. But what, what, what does the person who's experienced and practiced know about what they're trying to capture versus someone that isn't? So firstly, with your find with the great ones, it's hard, that's hard to explain because it's coming from inside. Let's go there. Okay. No, as in, as in inside in relation to um, you feel it, you actually know, you know instinctively that the gift of, of knowing, it's like a great painter or a great yeah. poet yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or a great musician, you know, you can learn a great amount and there are people that have done incredibly well with limited ability. Right. But if you're lucky enough to have that ability to be able to feel it from within and to be able to develop that because there are also people and I've worked with these people that have enormous gift, enormous talent, but they think that that's enough and it's not enough by itself right, because right, you've still right, got right. to practice and you've still got to work hard and yep. experience. Yep. So it's the combination of all of it, but the, 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 the feeling comes from, you know, you know, and you, you it, and and what becomes greater as you develop, or what should, and what has with me, is the consistency. So when I was a kid, and when I was starting out as a photographer, um, you you don't expect every picture. You know, you have a ratio. If you if you get twenty percent good. You know, I always had a higher ratio because I always was thinking, well, I've got to be better than everybody else. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if one person sees an out of focus picture, they're going to say or think something's wrong with his eyes. Mm -hmm. So I had to push myself and be better than yeah. everybody else, which helped me develop as a photographer as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. But uh, I guess here's what I'm driving at, because you mentioned something that was uh, really, really cool, which is that it's not that you you have to see what you want to photograph in your field of vision, but you have to anticipate it, right? Correct. A, a split second before, let's say. And you know it because you know it, right? Like there's some, you're capturing some human emotion, some, 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 I don't know, some fundamental aspect of our humanity, right? Through the thing that you're photographing. And first of all, I guess the, the question is more like, how do you know when, when is that right moment? It's like elation or embarrassment or, I don't know, power or 
whatever it is that you're that you're photographing in that moment like for example sports you said you know i can imagine uh you know as a photographer capturing uh you know a striker just about to kick the ball in the net and you can see in the background the fans maybe you can see a couple of the fans and they're just the 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 suspense in their faces right it's and it's this unity of of were like the entire crowd and everyone on the field are, are with the ball at that moment and the striker and the, and the and the keeper and whatever right they're, they're they're all invested in that one moment just at uh, one moment in time just before the ball hits the net and it's magical right because it's it's like this spiritual sacred existence of we're all hyper focused on this one small little ball and this one guy yeah. trying to trying to hit the ball in the net so that that's kind of an obvious one but um you know and, and, it, and it varies right sports politics music so how, how did you know how did you develop that that instinct to say okay this is the moment that i want to try to capture uh you you mentioned a, a, a term that's used a lot now which i think is a, is a is a very good term in relation to this hyper focus you're very in tuned to, and, and you see people who struggle to do things in other areas, but when they're able to hyper-focus on one area, you can't touch them. They're just like mm. incredible because they're so on it. Yeah. So in relation to photography, whether it's sport or any type of photography, when you're actually f physically using the camera in those situations, you're not, if you start overthinking it, and overanalyzing to the point that you described, mm -hmm. you'd actually miss the picture probably. Right. You know, you go into every situation. I'm always, or I was always thinking about what makes a picture or what I'd like or, you know, visualization. Like yeah. it's yeah. A, yeah. a technique that spe people sp speak about very openly now, visualization sure. and manifestation. You visualize and then you manifest. Um, with the camera, you're, you know, what you're looking for, but it doesn't always happen. But also, if you're looking too hard for that particular image, right. you can miss an, that particular image may not happen right. for three years. Right. You know, but you can miss a, a lot of other images that do that are just as powerful. Yeah. So you're you're thinking, what I'm thinking as I'm shooting is that I want the viewer of the photograph to be able to see what I'm seeing in that split second and how I'm seeing. So I'm not trying to overcomplicate things. You know, uh, when you're working for a magazine or a newspaper or whoever, you've got to think what your client wants from you. Like the Helen Mirren I knew was an upright um, f magazine cover in, in, a, in, a, in a photo shoot w with her and one other person away from all the branding. It's like an almost impossible picture. So mm. it wouldn't have necessarily been the way I would have chosen to shoot it. In fact, it wasn't. I told them the way I wanted to shoot it. But, you know, it, it wasn't able to be done on that day. They, they, you know, there's all the PR people and that they want what they want. And yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we've both been in the media. We know how it works. <laughs> yeah. But I knew what my client needed and I found a solution to, to do that. Um, but when I'm, if I'm in a situation where I'm just shooting then I shoot as I see and I shoot as I feel. And, and that's, regardless of my eye condition, that's how yeah. all the great photographers and the great artists yeah. would shoot. It's, it's from, from your feeling. And, it, and it's, oh, it's, it's, it's what's, uh, you know, one thing's to say that you're just going to shoot how you feel, but then you're also working. You're a professional. Correct. And it, it's, I suppose it's tempting to succumb to the pressure of oh boy i better deliver whatever it is my client needs like you it sounds like you actually block out that noise and just and just photograph i do now i'm 57 years old i've been doing <laughs> this for you know I, I was a professional photographer i was still a teenager working at the daily mail which was the top newspaper in england yeah it's still the the, the, the mail online is the biggest website in the world still the man online. the mail online oh the mail the, the really M -A -I -L is online is the biggest newspaper website in the world and you think that is because of the images that it, that are produced on the website or the no, I, text? No, I don't. I think because um, in a 
you know, in the media, wise people people want to see certain things, and, yeah. and so they cater to that. As a photographer back then, I was working as a sports photographer. I loved sport. I loved football, and I wanted to capture action. And I was always, which wasn't known till many years later, I was pushing myself that much harder because I knew that I, right. you know, to to do this, I had to be. I could never have a bad day because if there was a bad day and, and I did what most photographers do and didn't come back with a picture, you know, um, I didn't ever want to hear why did you not come back with a picture? Did you miss it or did you not see something? Or, and I never had that um, because I worked so hard at it. And that, that kind of follows on to your initial question is it doesn't matter how much talent you've got and it doesn't matter how motivated I was initially and what kind of person I am. If you haven't got the perseverance and the passion and the ability to practice, I mean, I practiced by doing it, but you've got to want it. You've right. got to do And th right. this is in any area that I speak to kids or parents of kids. You, you've got, and whatever it is in life, you've got to have passion. You've got to want to do it. If you don't want to do it, that's going to come through. So, look, it's hard when people go to work nine to five. A lot of people don't have the, you know, not fortunate enough to 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 they have to do certain things to make ends meet. Um, uh, and but then they may have another passion outside. But in order to become good at anything. You have to work really hard sure. and you have to be dedicated and committed. And that's always what I try and show to, 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 to others when, when they say, oh, I could be a sports photographer. Why can't you do? Uh, or someone who was visually impaired. Well, you know, why can't you do that? If you, if you work hard enough um, and, you, and you're passionate enough and you want it enough, That'll make a difference, and that'll help you in every aspect of your life as well. Yeah, every yeah, other aspect yeah. of your life. I mean, and your and your life is is a wonderful example of that attitude, right? It's if you work really, really hard and you keep a good attitude, like the doors will just continue to open for you, right? Because you're going to get better at the craft that you do. People will appreciate the effort that you put into it, plus the output. Obviously, they're going to want to work with you. <laughs> it's, well, it's, you know, it, look, it's not obvious. There's, there's no, but if you're, if you're, it helps. If you're producing good stuff, you're, prov you're therefore providing value to people that want Correct. images. Of course, they're going to want to work with you. Co right? Correct. Correct. You and know, you'll find a way to work. Like, I, you know, don't overcharge them, right? But you'll find a but way. But it to doesn't. Work. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, that people also need to understand that it's very tough as well. It's, yeah. you know, they, they see one side of it, which is very important to show, but everything, everything worthwhile and everything we do that we do to a high level or that we want to do it, that we want to achieve, you know, you look at everybody, and I always did from the time I was a kid, I was always very interested in looking at people who had achieved greatness through adversity yeah. and how they got there and, and their struggle. And it, and it was usually yeah. um, a struggle to get there. And people have also got to understand that it's not easy and that there are a lot of setbacks along the way and that you learn more from the setbacks and when things don't go in favour um, uh, or when they choose to use another photographer for whatever reason. So, so let's talk about the, the tough side. I mean, what kind of setbacks and challenges do you have to overcome? It's the same as anybody in any profession. It's no different because I'm, I'm visually impaired, because people never knew about that. It's, and, I, and I don't particularly, I, I wouldn't use the word setbacks. I, I prefer the word challenges. And everybody has them because no matter what environment you're in, for instance, uh, when, I, when I first started, I was in an environment where I was the youngest one by a considerable way. Mm. At national level, at still a teenager, most of those guys had worked their way through local papers and, and agencies and things like that before mm -hmm. they got anywhere near a national newspaper. Mm -hmm. I got into a national newspaper um, by the time I was already at 18, but I was working professionally at 19 <laughs> at that you level. You started at that level? Like your professional career yeah, started? I, I, w I did work, some work for a local paper, but I was, I was working for a national paper at the same time I was, before I was even a wow. full-time professional photographer. Wow. So, and, and I felt, wasn't an arrogance, I felt I was good enough to be at that level, sure. which I was, otherwise I wouldn't have been at it. Right, right. But that causes the same way, you know, we know, how it can be in any environment there are 
groups of people that don't necessarily like it when people right. are doing well right. Um, right. and would, would make it difficult. In my case, the only thing that, and it was a very, very competitive industry, it was mm. Fleet Street. It was the old Fleet Street, which was, you know, you ask about university, that's a university. Yeah. You, you, you're good enough to be in Fleet Street. People, all you have to do, you know, in most situations, even now, when people know you're a Fleet Street photographer, it's like, if people know you've been to Cambridge or Oxford, it's the same <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You, they know the level that you've worked at and, and what you had to do to, 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 to be at, how good you had to be at that right. level. But So you've also got a lot of people, and, and it's the same in every environment, where people are nervous and, and they're wary of their environment and, and they have fear of losing their jobs or whatever it's a human emotion to have fear yeah, yeah, yeah. um you know we've seen it more and more over the years um and in my case the only thing that i couldn't do that everybody else could do and was was really the hardest I was never able to drive you know i can't I can't get anywhere near to being able to drive. Mm. So, some people with this condition do do manage to get driving licenses in America, uh, which there's different levels of the condition. Yeah. So, but but it's again, like I said to you earlier, Kobe, it's not just about sight; it's about depth perception and things like that. Right. And when you're right. driving, you've got to be able to judge distance right. very oh. very quickly. Of course. So I wasn't able to drive. That made life very difficult. This was before laptops of being able to send pictures from. I had to get to oh, and from wow. places. Oh, that was the hardest thing. That was very very tough, and I had to carry very heavy equipment and then when other photographers that were didn't so much like the fact there was a 19 year old guy who was coming in when they you know oh david katz doesn't drive by the way um and and it was well how come you don't drive and i would oh i never learn and i would make it and fortunately or unfortunately at that time there was um the culture in, in national newspapers, like the culture in a lot of things in England, was alcohol. So a lot of the photographers used to, used to drink too much, especially at press events where there was free alcohol and things like that. Okay. So there were a lot of photographers and journalists who had lost their license because they'd been uh, stopped for drink driving. So... <laughs> what, well, well, you know, so, sometimes people would say to me, how come you don't drive? And I, I would never say I don't drive because of that. But they would say, oh, you lost, yeah, like they would nod like I lost my license. Like it was a, a part of a pat on the back in the club. Mm. You've lost your license. That's how terrible it was. <laughs> um, and it was like, OK, you want to believe I don't. If, if it stops you knowing the real reason why I don't drive, that I can't see far enough to drive. Um, then that's great. But listen, every stage of the way, you know, you're, you're, you're competing at the highest level um, and just to function day to day, yeah. normally for all of us, is tough. Yes. And to function with any kind of a condition is, is even tougher. And these were the days, yeah. unlike now, where it's a lot more open to talk about these issues now. Yeah. But it's, it's with you, I mean, you're tough, man. Not only did you have your condition right which limited you in certain ways but obviously amplified your your talent and others you you didn't weaponize it though you didn't say to them look guys i have this eye condition therefore i can't drive hey guys can you you know take it easy on me or or, or you know stop trying to block me this way or that way with certain publications like you, you didn't seek their sympathy you 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 you, you tried to compete as as though you were precisely one of them I was one of them. No, I know, I know, yeah. I know. And, and, you know what and, I mean? And Kobe, but... I, I didn't... Like that's... Com completely opposite of, that's... of what you said. I would have been... Even now, I find it hard to ask for help. Really? You know, or to... Now people know about my condition. I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a process. Yeah. You know, yeah, I thought yeah, straight... Yeah. Away, you know, when I first spoke about... I was always going to make my story public. It was just a matter of yeah. when and yeah. how. Yeah. Um, and when I decided, I, I needed to, to speak to some very close friends that never knew. Uh, and that was why we, we, we launched it as a film called Through My Lenses, which was a 15-minute film, which is on the internet, on YouTube, yeah. um, which tells the story because people didn't believe it. And, and so I, I and, and some of my, one of my closest friends who who 
is, you know, I've been friends with for 30 years and we work together as well as being friends extensively in the media for newspapers. Yeah. And he said, you know, you could have told me. He said, it wouldn't have made any difference. Um, I said, I really wanted to tell you and I'm actually, part of me would have wished that I did tell you, but tell me something honestly. His name's Mark. Tell me something honestly, Mark. Every time I came back, would that not have been in the back of your mind slightly that maybe David didn't do this or, or something because you know that David's got an eye condition? And he said, yes, it would be in the back of his right, mind. Right. So for me, it was like I didn't, I wasn't hiding it. If anybody, want, I didn't set out Kobe when I, when, even when I became... Even at 18 years old, I was still working in a day job and, and doing yeah. semi-professional photography. And they knew in the day job that I had an, an eye condition. People, you know, people never knew how bad it was. Um, but I just felt like it wasn't relevant for people to know. I, I wasn't ever going to play on it. Yeah. Um, it wasn't relevant. And, and also maybe a part of me wanted to even more prove that... And, and if it was well, it's good for you, you know, because right. he, oh, he's got an eye problem. Well, actually, you know, this is how everybody should work. And I worked even harder. I was even more thorough with everything yeah. than other photographers with the time I would get to events because I needed to get a close look at mm. things. And with the way I studied everything, I was the first one there, the last one to leave. Wow. I advise young photographers now, separate to any eye condition or anybody in doing any kind of thing like that, yeah. that's how you've got to be if you want to succeed it. Yeah, yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. it's very frustrating for, for our kind of generation to to watch that now sometimes because that it, it, there's not that mentality so much as it was but for me what drove me was I wanted to prove that I could be as good as the best in photography which was my love yeah and and I, I proved that so I, in fact even a couple of times in 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 our conversation so far I've, I've sensed a little defensiveness when I try to I want to try to understand it and I think you know yeah there's probably it seems to be a piece of you that's like fuck off I'm I'm independent and I'm I'm fully capable and right and that's great but yet on the other hand I wonder as you said right when you had this conversation with your friend Mark and it's this thing it must there must have been some kind of a weight on your shoulders of like I have this piece of me it's an integral part of my existence and it fuels me in one way and it limits me in others um and i can't really share it with that many people like only my parents maybe my close family know D uh, can you describe that i mean did you did it was it always in the back of your mind that you know something they don't they don't know about you and that's it's, it's kind of a big a it's, big issue it's a great point kobe um look i never i never dwell on it because you get on with it right and it was that background of no such word as can't right if i was a kid now probably and what i see with kids there's a, a slightly different mindset mm -hmm. um neither of them are wrong um uh, for me it was important about getting on with it i yeah. i never really thought about it day to day because it wasn't really relevant it was it everybody this is what's what my parents taught me when i was a kid everybody has something that they have to deal with right some people you can see it and some people you can't right but everybody has something yeah some people have it earlier some people have it later but everybody has to deal with something i'm no different yeah this is this is what i have to deal with now i can be one of those people which is not my personal personality who complains about everything right. who moans why me right, wasn't right. wasn't my personality wasn't how i was brought up right right um you 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 do it and you get on with it and you make the best of it it didn't take over my life day to day it was very hard um in relation to the fact of i couldn't i didn't drive yeah you know so right. i was always having to think which is amazing now because you know i always have a plan A, a plan B, a plan B, a plan C and a plan D because mm. you have to have coping mechanisms mm -hmm. in place, mm -hmm. um, which is why now when I'm talking about AI and um, 
advancements in technology that will help people with visual impairments, you also have to bear in mind, however amazing they are, I'm always thinking of a situation, well, what if the internet's not working? Or what if the phone battery dies? Or can I still go back to my... It's like now we, we don't read maps anymore because we've yeah. got yeah. ways and things yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, use it or lose it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and in relation to defensiveness, I never really saw it as a defensiveness. Maybe now I can completely, because obviously I've done a lot of work on understanding yeah. uh, my condition for, for myself and also in a way to be able to help others. Yeah. Um, d d defensiveness in the, perhaps in the line of questioning of like, you have this condition and therefore it somehow makes you different than other people like and then you shoot back and say i'm i'm just like all the other people that were in my profession or whoever no i think i think i meant it in a different way i'm not mm. sure if that's the way i, I that, that, that's the vibe i picked up but but okay. i take your i take your point completely which is to say yeah i was right so, we're all dealing with something right so yeah you but you you, you know what kobe it's a very valid point because back it back in those days you know i'd say from about seven years ago i would have looked at it that um you know i just want to be the same as everybody else yeah. and and but i've got something i excel at which is not the same as everybody right. else right but as i developed personally as well and understood more about my condition and because i was always going to make this public my career however much i loved it and what i achieved and i achieved incredible things in my career what, yeah. I, what I went on to do yeah um it was always as a platform and, and this was why I didn't want to be exposed by anybody else mm. rather than me coming out on my terms yeah um because I wanted to know that it wasn't a photographer coming out who had not that it's not great, but to work at local paper level. I worked at the highest level. You know, I was considered a world-class photographer. And um, I wanted, when I made my story public, to show what, the, you know, what, what could be achieved. And I wanted... So it was only really afterwards, once I was starting to think about how best to make the film and all, everything we did afterwards, because it went viral and it, it led to many things, um, which is exactly where we are today. Um, I feel now that I, I look back and I, I think, well, actually, how did I do that? And how, you know, because I had everything planned when I made my story public of, you know, when I was asked, how did I do that? I was, get, you know, well, I did it this, this, this and this. And yeah. it was true. I did do it. And, and, but there are times now I look back in, in hindsight. Yeah. And I think, you know, wow, um, how, how did I do that? And, and look, but also now I, I, I actually do consider myself different, in, but in a, in, in a, not in a... Not in an arrogant way, but in a way that, yeah, this is my thing. I've got this condition and I am different. And it's okay to be different. And it was sure. always actually okay to be yeah. different. It was just the way I dealt with it. Yeah. And maybe maybe some people would have dealt with it a different way, come out and spoken about it a lot earlier. If I would have, wouldn't have gone into photography, I would have probably not, you know, I would have probably spoken about it quite earlier. But there was something in me that just wanted to be treated and I'll tell you exactly why, because I can see you, you have that deepness and, and questioning, and it's very important for people listening to, to understand that there's always, there's always a cause and effect, and mm -hmm. an effect and a cause, mm -hmm. okay? So growing up as a, as a young kid, you know, kids don't know any different, and, and back in those days it was very different, and I come from a fairly tough background of, of, an, of an area, um, and you had to be tough to survive, like a lot of kids. Mm. Like, um, kids could see um, I had moving eyes. That was funny. Yeah. So goggle eyes, cat's eyes. You know, my name's cat's eyes, cat's eyes, wobbly oh, eyes. Okay, okay. So, you know, there was name calling. And so I had to learn different coping mechanisms, yeah. how to deal with that, whether I was going to be one of those kids that let that defeat me and, and be intimidated um, right. uh, for the rest of my life right. or was I going to deal with it which I did yeah um but but there was a, a, an incident that I go back to uh, it was a lovely friend of mine who I'd actually been to nursery school with as well and we went all the way through like 
first school junior school, high school together. Um, but in, in junior school, we were in this, an infants, we were in the same class. Lovely girl called Gillian. And we were having an art class. And um, I was never any good at art. And it was very frustrating because I wanted to be, like I said earlier. Yeah. And um, I did something. Somehow it came out really well. And it looked really good. And I said to Gillian, I said, like, what do you think? And I was really excited. And she said wow David that's really good and I was like I was so excited and then she said and she didn't mean anything by it at all it was just a child's reaction she said it's good for you okay so and that that was uh, and as I as I, it, it wasn't like an earth-shattering thing at that moment that it changed my whole life it didn't it was just something that yeah. It was like, okay, you think that's good for me? Well, let's mm. see when I get to a stage that I can do better than anybody else. So I always push myself harder um, and I wanted to be, I knew I needed to be. Listen, to be a photographer, look, I was given a bit of advice when I first started. I, I received very, very little advice from anybody when I started. <laughs> which may have been a good thing. I think it's a great I, thing, yeah. 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 I got very little advice. I got incredible encouragement from, from my mother. Unfortunately, my, my father passed away um, w um, when I w just after my 16th birthday. So it, it was like he, he'd said to me, David, at that point, I'd just come back from my first holiday without my parents here to, in Israel. And I came back, had taken his camera again, a small Instamatic, and he said, you've got a real talent for this. You know, we'll, we'll get you a camera, uh, like a proper camera, which wow. I did end up doing in my wow. first week as, uh, yeah, 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 as yeah. a paid employee. Yeah, yeah. Fortunately, he passed away. But he was the one that actually said, you, you know, you've got a real talent for this and, and, and you should pursue further. Um, but so, so with that in the back of my mind, Kobe, and, and most people will go back to a, a time if they've given it enough thought and insight yeah. um, of certain key things that, that happened to them in their lifetime right. that led to, to where they are now. And then yeah. you don't always remember that or you choose to forget it or time passes by and yeah. then you get to a stage where you or some people are reflective and you, you go through different things right. to, to learn more about yourself and how this this happened to develop again within personal development because you know i'm 57 hopefully i've got a few more years to to, <laughs> to get better and to do more um so well, you we're always trying to improve but what, but she said to me um it, it, it's good for you and and that's something it's like all right i'll show what's good so for me what's lovely about your story is that yes you have this chip on your shoulder from you know being made fun of as a kid and so being treated as oh well, well I guess you're you're not going to be as uh, productive as the rest of us, right? And you're saying oh I'll show all of you. You know what's lovely about your story is that it, it never turned vengeful. It never turned vengeful. It never turned oh, dark. Yeah. It was like I'll show you, but I'll show you how good I can do. Yeah, that's not my personality. It's no, no, no. Life. But but you know it, it 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 can go both ways. Of course. And in your case. It's like, let me capture uh, moments of deep humanity and like help broadcast all that to the world. Like, right. that's, <laughs> that's pretty but, awesome, but man. It can also <laughs> work two ways, Kobe, in that people can be led in different directions mm. to, to, to turn it one way or another. What do you mean? Well, you know, you look at some of the... Um, you, you look at information... Look... The, now, as in when we're recording this, there's a lot more information available that's easy to, to access than it used to be when I was growing yeah. up. Yeah. Um, and so you can see a lot more things out there for good and for bad. And dependent on your personality and the people around you, um, you can uh, mostly go one way or the other. It, it's, it's, I don't think there's a set thing that someone will go that way or that way specifically because of what will happen it's it's events can can lead but also things that are going on around you that you're seeing on youtube and things like that mm. if, you, if you see only a, you know i'll give you an example 
of, of, of how people can look at things differently. You know, we, we, we live in a country where there's always something going on. Yeah. And it can always be looked at outside and inside in a negative way, yep. dependent on who's passing sure. that information. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last few weeks, it's been particularly, I'm not going to go into, we all know what it's been, um, but it's been particularly tough. Now, that, that's got exposure all over the world, and a lot of people that have seen it don't really understand, and a lot of people that have seen it don't really understand. And it's also interesting from your point of view, because if you just look at a picture you can easily come to the conclusion that the entire country, literally nine or almost 10 million people are, are, are protesting on the streets Correct. where it's actually, what, like 5% or so? Correct. Right? Actually, most of us are just getting on Correct. with daily life and it's rather boring. It, you know? I mean, even more so, yeah. on Friday, I was invited along to Bat Yam uh, to uh, a group called Hagal Shelly who um, help underprivileged kids in that area mm -hmm. um, through surfing. And we went specifically in relation to kids with disabilities being shown how to surf with muscular dystrophy, which is a, a condition that you don't normally go beyond 20. The muscles waste away to the point where wow. you can't breathe. You're wow. in a wheelchair very young. Wow. And surfing and, and movement and having a positive attitude will give them a better way of managing the condition. I went along to speak to these kids and to photograph these kids mm -hmm. in relation to what I see and what I do. Yeah. Now, I would love, and, and, and again, you're right what you say, that you're, with, with one picture you can see just what, but if you show people properly what's going on they can see and if people look at a wider view of everything yeah. which is what i always suggest they'll get a wider understanding and then they can make their own decisions yeah. Yeah. so the the combination and how i relate it to what we're talking about today from my past and how i've been is you know people can concentrate and think oh everything's bad and you know this is how it is and oh, why should i do anything and blame everybody except or they could see, like I saw on a Friday morning, a group of the most amazing volunteers come on their day off mm. to help a group of kids that help them in their whole life. So it's all about the way we perceive things and the way that we right. look at things. Right. And, and, and th what I do through a camera is one way of being able to show people um, uh, how you can learn how to maximize the good that you can do rather than concentrate on the bad because sure. there's, there's so much bad around we can live our whole lives and it's very easy to get caught up in all of that and i'm sure we've all been through that because we've all been through sure you know our not enough to get to that stage we've we've worked in the media it's it's not the greatest business I'm, i mean when i so i, I was um i was still the uh, bureau chief uh, at Bloomberg in May 2021, which was the last time there was a war, I guess, right? But we, we, between Israel and, um, and Hamas and Gaza. And that was also the time when there were all these riots in the mixed cities, mm. if you remember. Okay. Um, and you know, so, so my job was to, was to be aware of, follow, and report on essentially the, the worst things that were happening in this area every single day. Correct. Multiple times a day. Yeah. And if you, if you just take a moment to think about what those things are, right? A, a rocket is launched and it blows up a building and kills a family or, uh, you know, um, Arab rioters uh, torch a, a restaurant and a hotel in Akko. You know, you have almost a lynching in, in a city uh, close to Tel Aviv. These are terrible things. In fact, if, if you just put yourself in the mindset of the victims, but even the perpetrators of these things, it's terrifying. Mm. And that's a pretty bad way to, to leave this earth. So I was dwelling on these things all the time because that was my job. And, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't good for me. And I don't think it's good for people in general to only perceive the world in that in that way i mean you 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 can't look away but as you said take a much wider perspective and things sort of restore themselves to their proper balance 
Correct. Look, we come from the same world. I, I, I as in the, the, media. I was, yeah. I was in that that world for a long time. I, yeah. I, 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 I've been there and done it, and I saw everything, and 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 I have the scars to prove it, like we all do. However. What I don't want to do, what, what I've seen happen and what I don't want to happen with me and what I would always advise others is to let those things blind you, and I, I use that word, let those things blind you or us to the fact that we live in a world where there are remarkable people and there are remarkable things done and ultimately um, we should try and do our best and, and look out for others. There are unfortunately um, a lot of situations out there where people are trying to get other people to concentrate on negativity all the time. Yeah. And that's a real shame. And what I could do is I could sit here for three hours with you and I'm sure we could swap stories from now till kingdom come concentrating on on those things yeah people know we know what i what i want to do is take what i've learned with everything including those things and bring in positivity and hope so that people can see that yeah this is what we have to deal with day to day we live in a certain region other regions they deal with other things we know what goes on we know the realities we know the realities a lot better than a lot of people yeah. that report on it um you know what i i as you were talking i i had this thought pop into my mind was because I'm, I'm still dwelling on like on on what i what i perceived as defensiveness but now i actually i think i understand it a little bit better which is i think i'm just projecting my weakness onto you which is like oh gosh if i had that condition there's no way i could have done what david did and you're saying back to me of course you can yeah you you, you don't know that kobe because you didn't have to deal with it you've probably right. dealt with other things in your life that other right. people right. couldn't deal with or right. wouldn't deal with right <clears throat> People only know, it's like when, when we're trying to explain in, in relation to fundraising or getting people's budgets to, to, to be able to do certain yeah, things yeah. separate to the charity side of things. Um, and, and really, the people that understand it the best are the ones that have actually experienced right, it themselves. Right, right, right. And, and I, would say, I would always think, some, sometimes it's frustrating, but you think, well, why would they know? They, they didn't. Yeah. Li so yeah. whereas I know and, and, and I'm glad you said what you said, because I, I didn't um, I don't feel I'm defensive in relation to that. Yeah. I, I have a toughness, which is understandable about it. Yeah. Um, and I have a resilience because I've had to. Otherwise, yeah. I would have been not just a seven year old being made fun of. I would have been an eight, nine and the rest of my life. Right. That stopped at right. seven because right. because my parents showed me the best way to stop it. And it wasn't, it didn't yeah. mean that it didn't happen from time to time. Right. But I didn't have the victim mentality. Right. Because of what my power, my parents taught me and my own personal personality. Um, do I have um, wounds from things that have been, that we've, we've seen and witnessed? Absolutely. Yeah. More than I actually realized. And I've spent a long time try, uh, and, I, and, and, and I try and help and advise others to do the same. And now it's more open that you can speak about these things. Like, you know, I worked extensively around footballers uh, and boxers. And um, you, you hear um, boxers and, and, and footballers who, who were superstars, legends, and you hear them speaking now openly about struggles that they've had with, with mental illness, with yeah. addictions. Yeah. So that's already dramatically helping people from before. It's like people that were going through certain struggles thought, well, no, the celebrities don't. It's like, it's like the, girl, the, the, the girls, the young women, they, they look at the, the, the fashion models and they why don't I look like that? Yeah. Well, they don't look like that because they haven't sat in makeup for five hours and then another five hours of Photoshop and lighting, right. you know, because that's how the girl that was photographed looks before all of that. Right. They don't realize that. Right. Um, and that's the, 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 the thing. So it's a case of, of trying to... But even someone like, like in your case, right, if, if, uh, which, you know, you are such an admirable person, um it's tempting as someone listening to this to skip to the end and say, look at what all, all the things that David has accomplished um, without just to skip to the ending, but not to go through 
it's just the day by day, piece by piece of putting all of that together and all the struggle and all the heavy stuff that you had to carry Correct. and all the relationships that you had to maneuver and and the times where someone was prodding about why you can't drive and like how do you deal with that in your own mind every single day right and and, and then of course the further you you advance along your your journey the the more challenges the newer challenges that Correct. you're going to have to deal with right because because everything is new everything yeah. is novel right you're, you don't continue to climb up just by doing the same thing over and over and over again right yeah. it's just it's new people it's new situations and each you wake up every day and you say oh christ i gotta do all this all over again right and figure something out and uh and then when you look back then you as you say right it's like oh wow i did all that right but uh but uh, yeah I, I can appreciate when you say that it, it's it's tough and it's not easy um um okay so let's um so yeah you, go ahead. you have to you ha it's very important what you just did to point that out to people because so when i when i made the story public or even now you know i get asked to 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 speak uh in keynotes to to, to doctors and to to, yeah. to all kinds of people all over the world i go on television yeah. podcasts and why i like what you're doing with long form is that you can actually go into the meat and bones of it whereas sure. on a tv interview or uh three minutes because people haven't got how do you convey it's, you, this? Ca you can't so what people see and this is why it's very important to to keep in the way that you produce co the the content and the because it's very easy now everything everybody wants like 30 second sound bites right, right. right and and it's not a you know, it's useful in some things, but as a long-term thing, it's not useful because right. someone could pick up my resume or, or look at the videos on the blind photographer um, and, wow, you know, every day is amazing. Look at what he's done. Look at who he knows. Look at who knows him. Great. And, it, and it's all true. But what it took to, to get there and then when you get there, because a lot of people get, it's like, if people have never had money and they think suddenly if they've got money that everything's going to be okay, well, it's often not because they're not actually ready to, to deal with it. It's just another set of problems in a more comfortable apartment. Right, so, right, right, right. you know, it's the same with fame, you know, and the same with notoriety. Um, and, and, and again, it's conditioning um, from outside, which again is something that we see more now because of social media and things like that, that everything's got to be a certain way because it's all instantaneous gratification. Yeah. That, you know, you watch something like Pop Idol or something like, I shows how out of date I am with it all, you know, the, <laughs> because it wasn't called that for years. But, um, you know, they come in and they're an overnight sensation, right? Well, they're going to struggle if they do become that pop star because they haven't put in all the work right. and, and done the work internally and right. externally. And that's why most of them go as quickly as they come right. whereas you look at a group like you know if you just want to use an example the Beatles or, or, or really people who really went through the clubs and they by the time they were ready for it they knew how to deal with it yeah. even then it's hard the saying is it takes years to become an overnight exactly, success exactly and right? it does yeah, yeah, yeah. it does and I've been in I've been in those situations yeah. but I think it's very important that people do know um the good and, and, and the not so good, because people tend to think, you know, they look at, the, they'll look at mine or, or someone else's, which is great, because it, it'll give them an instant lift, yeah. which is great. But then some people, dependent on their environment and the people around them, will hear, I can't do that. I haven't got this. I haven't got that. I haven't got the money. I can't do that. Right. I can do that. Right. And, and then they think, well, oh, it was easy for him. You know, he, he was in this situation. <laughs> well, you know what, actually, it was very tough. And, and you, but you need to, to, to be more rounded and to understand yeah. that as you get older and as you develop uh, and as you do the inside work. Um, I, but would I, would I, if, if, I, if I was your media advisor, say, and you had to give a 30-second clip, and, and obviously you can tell me if you think differently or not, but I just love the fact that from a very early age you were imbued with support from two people who said you can you can do it yeah absolute key and you you know i i i i say it all the time that 
that that was the luckiest, most amazing thing that happened to me. Um, and, and I know how lucky I am because, and how lucky I was, because unfortunately neither of my parents are, are with us anymore. Yeah. Um, not everybody has that situation with their parents. Um, some people, it might be a, a, a relative or a teacher or a friend or, you know, but it's important to have people like that around you and to be around and, and learning with and from the right people because there is so much negativity out there, Kobe. It's so easy yeah. to get caught up in all the bullshit. Um, and we've all done it and we've all been caught up in it and that's what helps us develop when, when, you're, when, you've, when you're able to. Some people are caught up in that spiral constantly. So I was incredibly lucky to have the start that I had but what I wanted to go on to do because of that start and as well as is to help to be that person and to encourage others who may not have the parents that I have and they rely on them. I have the most incredible group of, small group of people, close friends around me. Yeah. That, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that's what's important. And we, we play off of each other's um, good things and we play off of each other's bad things. But ultimately what I've learned, and, and like you were saying earlier, uh, I, I've seen the worst of the worst. I, I really have with, with it professionally, um, and personally, and it's enough to pr maybe disillusion everybody. And that's why I don't need to, to speak about it. I, I've dealt with it and I've learned that I can carry on harping about it and this was hard and this was wrong and they shouldn't have done that. And I've done my bit at doing that, but I'm, I'm at a stage now with everything that I'm doing that I want to be able to, they can go elsewhere if they want to be around negative and, and, yeah. and, and bad situations because they're not hard to find. Yeah. But there's also a lot of good and there's a lot of things that can be achieved and there's a lot of good people out there and we all, including me and I'm sure you, need to be reminded of that sometimes because we all, even at this stage, have days or weeks sometimes that we feel like, totally. what, what's the point? Right. And then we see the most amazing thing and that's why I used that as an example on Friday at But Yum. Because it suddenly reminds you, these are kids. You know, I was born with, a, with an eyesight condition. My, my condition is not a terminal condition. I can, I can live a fairly normal life. These kids are going to be dead by the time they're 25, most of them. And they're living in wheelchairs from the time they're three or four. So you can take a lot of different things and look at things and think. And, and this is actually one of the things my parents were good at, very good at showing me, which must have been very hard for them as well. And it was. There's a lot of people far worse off than you. And we used to sit in the hospital and they'd say, look at the kid in the wheelchair that can't hold himself up and things like that. Yeah. You know, you still think at seven, eight years old, like, why me? And, and yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, yeah. You, you need, we need to remember that. And this is why the work that I do in relation to consulting and advising and keynoting and using my story as a platform to show what can be achieved. Yeah. Well, if you want to, you know, and, and before we uh, before we started recording, we we're talking a little bit about technology and sort of the, the pros and cons. And um, one of the things that I love about podcasts is precisely what you're talking about is, is uh, these um, in-depth sources of inspiration, right? Which is, you know, you're part of a continuum right? when you had the luck of having been born to your father and mother and they give giving you that 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 grounding to say do it go for it you can do it we believe in you and then you do it and now you have the medium to then spread this to anyone that's willing to listen anyone that's willing to step away from their negative framing of the world and their life and to say okay well maybe there is maybe i can use my condition to propel me in some in some way in some real way that that benefits people many people in fact and and who knows, right? Like that, that, that's the lovely part of, of this medium, which is, you know, you can use it for so many different, for so many different uh, purposes, but this is, you know, one that's close to my heart, which is like, I wouldn't be here today if there weren't other people who were doing podcasts that uh, nurtured my soul in some, in some way. And I'm trying to pay that back. Isn't in, that amazing? Uh, yeah, of course, of course, of course. But don't you find, um, so w what you said in relation to, um, 
doing it to, 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 to kind of progress yourself. I, I actually didn't do it for that. I did it to help others. I That's what I mean. But, but um, <laughs> what it did, which is an amazing thing, I was having this conversation with someone the other day, <clears throat> Helping other people or showing other people in the way that I did helped me more than I could have ever imagined. Yeah, of course. Uh, I, I didn't realize because yeah. it's, you know, we're, we're all still developing and we're all still, you know, yeah. progressing. And, and, and when you look at the open book of, of where I've been and where I've come and where I'm going, you know, the, the being around, you know, being able to, to give that and, and, and as a result, people open, and the, this is what you're saying about the podcast, people, and this is why I loved long form as well, yeah. uh, as opposed to short form TikTok stuff, right. people have a chance to open up and go in depth yeah. and you get to see the real side of, this, of, of sure. what it takes. Right. Because it's never just that one, oh, I'm a celebrity overnight and, and, and get on. Because anybody who's really gone through something or achieved has achieved through, and, and they've actually learned their best lessons by, by things that haven't gone the way that they wanted to, you yeah. know, where they've fallen down yeah. and had to get up and continuously had to do it. And then, like what you're saying, and I also... Um, you know, as I'm getting older, my, my condition is not a degenerative one as such. But as you get older, your everything changes through age anyway. So my, it's be, it's becoming even more challenging with certain things. And and this is why, going forward, we'll, maybe we'll talk about AI in, in relation to this. But um, it, it is becoming more difficult. But so I was relying more and more on not reading. So it was audio books and and podcasts. And I heard the most incredible inspirational. Um, podcasting and you know this is why I'm always so keen to when I get invited like today to, to ask and, and you, you did it so quickly and I like that as well because a lot of people tend to say oh we want you to come on we'll be in touch next week and next month next year if someone wants to do something and, and my story proves that if someone wants to do something they do it you you heard about me you spoke with Avi you you got in touch we're here I think less than a week later talking yeah, yeah. and and as podcasts helped both of us Hopefully there's someone, or not hopefully, but I'm sure there, there are people that are listening right now to yeah. us and will do in the future that maybe are going through a really tough time. And I'm sure there we know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and, yeah. and we'll listen to this. And, you know, but you've still got, a, we've still got to get up off our own asses and, and do it. <laughs> but it, 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 it helps yeah. to, like, dramatically yeah. with podcasts. And, and this is where it's that flip side of kind of modern technology is you know I, I watch a lot of um stuff that's um older talks done that they were still they they've got onto youtube but they were done on cassette recorders with really bad microphones and it's amazing that and, and i think about how those guys would have been in this era you know um and we're, we're, we're lucky in that respect that we can reach a lot of people yeah. quickly yeah. When, when we want to. And with the right material and the right people, with the right messages, uh, you know, I don't like this, this whole thing often now, the way that the word messaging is, is used, you know, because it's like, oh, you've got a message a certain way. But I suppose there's no better word to define it in relation to being able to put across a positive positive attitude of saying look this is this is what i've done this is what can be done this is what others are doing um but also <laughs> not easy um you know but one day you'll, you you maybe will be able to to give the benefit of your experience what i was taught yeah. by someone very close to me was not to tell people um as in tell them what to do is to show them yeah exactly that that anyone can do it correct including whoever's listening to this correct and and that's very Literally important. anyone yeah, and, yeah and this yeah. is why what you're doing and yeah. you know uh, the the podcast medium in general uh, and and also you know we were in a situation that we were uh, traveling was taken away from us yeah. something that we all took for granted yeah. was taken away from us and it's like okay well how do you if you if i can't stand in front of an audience in a in a Texas or, or London or somewhere, how can we get the message out? And yeah. this is the way. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
I guess we'll end here. But what what um what are you doing these days? I mean, so you're you're uh, are you still um taking pictures? I will always take pictures. <laughs> I don't do it full time professionally. I haven't been a full time professional photographer for ten years. So it's whenever you feel the need. When, or the, it's the not urge. when I feel the need. It's when, when I when when I feel I can use it for something that makes a difference. So I mm -hmm. if I get asked, I was asked a few years ago. Uh, to go to Tanzania with a group of American eye doctors to show how people in the villages never get a visit from an eye doctor and a simple pair of glasses or something like that can change their life. Suddenly they can read the Bible. Something like that to document that ties in with what I'm doing. Um, wow. So, so you I, were documenting someone having their vision corrected for... Yeah, for and, the, and then, wow. then in, in that particular instance... Part of what we did was with a group of kids, a big group of kids, that had albinism in Tanzania. Albinism is a death sentence in some African countries because witch doctors still believe that it's um, a curse um, from, from, or from their parents, but they believe that the limbs and the bodies of anybody with albino are worth a lot of money to help people with health. Oh, my God. So the kids are often murdered um, or sold uh, when they're babies or, or they're put into care where they're hidden. Oh, my God. Um, and I went and saw these kids, and it was like, okay, I wasn't born in Tanzania, otherwise that's me. And I spoke to these kids. I had my, well, I don't speak Swahili, as you can probably imagine, but I was <laughs> translated. Yeah. And then I went back to a year and a half later because of everything that happened. Um, I went back to the people that fund the doctors going out to yeah. help the people in the villages yeah. and other doctors to tell my story as the photographer that went with the group. Halfway through my story, this was what was agreed with the, the organisers, mm -hmm. that the audience never knew. Halfway through, I show a picture of a, of a, of a baby and uh, I start to talk a little bit about that baby and when it was born and that baby is me. And they realise that I... And then I talk about what I spoke to you about and it was like so th this has been the progression um, and obviously we were quite limited for, for a while of being able to move around now yeah. we're able to move around a lot more so what I do now is organisations come to me or, or in some cases I go to them if I feel that um, it's relevant and consult with them they ask me in relation to um, visual impairment how I dealt with visual impairment in relation to photography, in relation to combining the two, in relation to mm. accessibility, because that's the key thing right now that everybody seems to be talking about, inclusivity and diversity. Now, that's fantastic, um, because before, it was at the other end of the extreme, where no one, you know, unless you fitted in a certain thing, you, you didn't fit in any way around. That was problematic. Um, my feeling is that there is still, there's an improvement in relation to accessibility for people with visual impairments and giving opportunities to, but it's not as much as a lot of people are making out right now that are in the inclusivity, diversity area. Now, what also is becoming very prevalent and, and we're seeing more and more is the advent of AI, artificial intelligence, in relation to helping with certain conditions now we're all using it anyway to an extent sure you know photoshop was an early form of, of ai google google yeah, exactly yeah. so we're all using it i used it to get here on the bus and and, and on the map to mm -hmm, get here mm -hmm. so we're all using it in relation to accessibility for people with visual impairment i look at my situation how how my situation what I need to do for me and how that can help others. So I'm at a situation now in, in relation to what I was telling you before that m my, for, for the last few years, my condition is changing. So things I was, you know, I never grew up in a blind school. So, you know, people used to say he doesn't walk like a blind guy. It was actually said by someone who ran a blind school. You know, I don't because I wasn't brought up that way. Yeah. But um, I have to now... Uh, adapt to doing certain things because there's certain things that are a lot tougher for me to do walking at night steps and different conditions that I, I, I've toughed it out before and you know 
even even the other day I was going somewhere and I walked into one of those low bollards that just come up to the knee that I just couldn't possibly have seen. Right. Um, but there's wonderful apps around, some some amazing, some some you know starting up, um, and technology out there that can dramatically help people with visual impairments in finding places and reading um, things in supermarkets and buses. Again, people, you wouldn't think about the struggle of getting a bus, being at a train station, Mm. being at an airport. So what I'm doing now and what I'm very keen to be continuing is working with companies, obviously because my story is unique, it's motivational, it's unique in the fact that there are a lot of, and I've learned this since I made my story public, there are a lot of kids with visual impairments that actually love photography and want to take pictures, um, which is something I'm working with them on and and more towards giving them that empowerment and that confidence um and there are a lot of um there are a number of photographers that have been photographers at a good level that have started to develop a sight problem like i think you thought mine was when they're older whereas my condi- my situation i had a sight problem Before I became a photographer, I then became a photographer at the highest level without people knowing that I had a sight problem. To the best of our knowledge, six years on after launching the story, that is a unique story. So what I'm saying to people that have apps or, or websites or that broadcast to people with disabilities, with visual impairment, is that they're not actually, a lot of them are not actually using people that are visually impaired to either test their stuff or to, to promote their stuff. Really? The real people that use it. It's not where you would think it would be. And, and this is mm. a frustration that I have when we're living in this time of... So who, how, how can they make these applications for without actually testing it on the people that will that's use it? That's a great question, Kobe. So, because they're using AI, <laughs> they're using like technology. <laughs> and look, there's some brilliant whiz kids with computers who can okay. do amazing things and who do amazing things. Yeah. And I'm not saying they, all of them, don't use people visually impaired people in the testing yeah but visually impaired people are not included as we stand right now in the kind of things in relation to those products as much as they should be Mm. in relation to working with and actually being taken into companies that are not necessarily working on um technology for visual impairment that are just regular companies that are doing whatever they do yeah but because they're visually impaired oh he you know they're, they're not given that opportunity now i'm sure a lot of people will say with with inclusivity and diversity yeah everybody's given equal well it's not equal i'm telling you that mm. i'm saying that to to anybody that's listening that to that and not in a negative way i'm saying that in a realistic way as someone who is visually impaired who's achieved what i've achieved who is advocating to others with visual impairment who can mix with anybody yeah. from any walk of life and has done and will do but when people say to me you know this, 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 and this, the fact of what I'm seeing right now, and I'm very happy to be shown differently um, by listeners or, 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 or viewers, um, to visually impaired people being taken on by companies to help promote awareness in whatever way it is to other visually impaired people and then leading on to other people in relation to accessibility through disability because again we hear these words inclusion diversity fantastic but what i'm seeing as a disabled person registered to disabled i have a to die i have a certificate of blindness which means i'm registered blind mm-hmm. to get that certificate you you have to be really at a low level of sight um, so I'm in a position to be able to to, to speak and to be taken so if, seriously. If, if, I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, there are not enough people who are visually impaired, blind, um, approaching companies to work with no, them? No, the other way around. The other way around, the saying other way around. we're developing something that will possibly yeah. help you 
but let us know if this yeah. actually collides in the, with the real world yeah. in a meaningful because they, way. They think, and it's great, because it's still better than it was when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, an iPad would have helped me enormously at school. Something as simple as an iPad. Mm. Um, they're a lot better in schools than they were. But okay. um, they still assume... Pe- people with an eye ca- uh, like a visual impairment, um, it's, it's, it's not... a so they, they assume, oh, we'll make the font on the website bigger because they're covering their, 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 their rules that they've got to be seen to be catering to people with disabilities. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong, that's better than it was right. because before it was nothing. Right. So the fact that they are doing that, they are doing it. But what I'm finding as someone in my position with my professional hat on and my personal hat on and all my experiences is that there's an, the people that are checking boxes in England, we call it ticking boxes that, mm-hmm. yeah, we've done, we've done what we set. Okay. Yeah. You're doing it, but you you could be doing it a lot better right. and a lot m- with a lot more, right. um, you know, uh, in a lot better way. And it's, is it really just as simple as an issue of consideration that the, yeah. the people, they just, it doesn't cross their mind that they should talk to. Well, them. look, a, a lot, again, we, we started uh, at the beginning talking about fear and things like that. Um, there's a lot of people that, that have fear for different reasons of not wanting to rock boats. And, mm. you know, and now on the other extreme, there's, there's a thing of you've, you can't say anything to anybody because someone's going to get upset. <laughs> you know, it's gone from one crazy extreme to, to yeah, the next yeah, crazy yeah, yeah, extreme. Yeah. What you want to find is a happy medium. I mean, so, someone said to me the other day... <laughs> You know, um, he, he posted a reply to on, on my LinkedIn, um, very, very complimentary, who knows the story from every angle, and yeah. he said about the blind photographer. And he was sent a message by LinkedIn saying, are you sure you want to use the word blind? Because that might offend the person that you're... Okay, so I told you, I was called goggle eyes, wobbly eyes. That, that's offensive, okay? Being called blind, how do you define someone... If you don't have the general vocabulary yeah. of someone with with not very good eyesight, right, 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 <laughs> visually also, impaired or blind, yeah. that's what they are. That's what we are. Yeah. Okay. So the people have got to be a little bit careful about going too crazy. So so we've got this situation where everybody's a lot of people are scared to do certain things. Okay. You know, there's cutting back on budgets and all these kind of thing, and then you've got the people that are just doing things to check boxes. However, there are still and we're hoping through things like this and what I'm doing and what other people are yeah, doing yeah, that yeah. the awareness will become greater and there will be brave people like there always are in these companies who run these companies and these organizations who will say, you know what, let's actually give it a go. Let's, let's actually put our money where our mouths are. We're, especially the ones that are adver- you know, making money from people with visual impairments and another thing i'll add kobe at this point i can't remember off the top of my head but it's very easy to google the exact figure of how many people in the world have visual impairments and it's a lot more than people realize right what are we talking what 10 like um i think i can't i'm can't remember off the top of my head but let's let's say it's a couple of hundred million people in the world with varying degrees of visual impairment. In 10 years' time, there's going to be double that. And it's not because there's going to be more people born like I am with a visual impairment. There's going to be more problems visually because we're all looking all day, every day, at screens Mm. and at monitors, and we're straining all the time with technology and and um everything around us that's going is already causing more people you know someone sits at a desk eight hours a day looking at a laptop in a chair that's you know you don't need to be an expert to to know that's not good for you yeah so there's going to be an effect to that so people generally and this was one of the reasons why um i was so adamant in the beginning in relation to using techniques to manage the condition in alternative ways, things like um, acupuncture and um, Pilates and um, c- different things like I learned from the time I was a kid yeah. to help manage those conditions. However, there are a lot of people that within a few years will be struggling w- 
with, with without glasses needing better prescription bigger prescription and and getting illnesses as a result of this yeah now the so the technology available and um, that will be available won't just be useful to to me it'll be useful to them as well that's not really being addressed at that, this moment because people, the majority of people are not seeing that and not thinking far enough ahead. So, you know, people might say, oh, it's just for people that are visually impaired. Well, actually, you know, it's for everybody. And these technologies that visually impaired people can really help um, advocate for and improve because we're actually living... 24 7 with those different kind of conditions and if we're the ones that are consulting and then advocating i'm very fortunate because you know i have a story behind me i have a per certain personality i'm well known i'm able to get up in front of cameras and in microphones and speak um about it but there are other people that don't necessarily have those opportunities for yeah. whatever reason yeah um and what we want to do is to be able to give those people if they want them yeah. the opportunities to 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 be able to so how, how can uh, if, if anyone's interested i mean and, and and wants to get in touch with you or or any organization that you know is is doing any work on on helping using technology to help the visually impaired how, how should they get in touch with you well first i'm very easy to to reach i, I mean, you, 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 you got <laughs> you got through to me very easily um you know th through my lenses uh is on youtube i have the website the blind photographer which has contact details on and has a record of all my um everything that i've done up until this point um so pe people can find me easily enough um Companies that um, want to do something will do something. The, the greatest thing is, is the kind of thing that you're doing is giving a platform to someone like myself to be able to speak to more people. And, you know, like we said in a, in a way of you never know what someone's going through um, today that they've woken up feeling really rough. They don't know what they're going to do tomorrow. They hear this and that gets them through the day and hopefully through tomorrow. Um, it's the same in relation to someone listening who is you know developing an app or developing a technology mm. or wanting to um give their um their knowledge their experience to people with disabilities or who are visually impaired yeah that might stir something in them to say you know what um, or there are there are companies maybe there are people listening CEOs and CTOs um, and marketing people um, who know that they're actually should be utilizing that they could be doing a little bit more. Yeah. They're, they're, the fact they're doing is great and it, it's a great start, but there's there's a lot of room for improvement, Kobe, and and I, I'm dedicating the rest of my life to being involved in in that and using my story to to bring that about. That's beautiful, man. You, you put a smile on my face. <laughs> um, cool. Let's end it here. David, thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for doing this. This was, this was wonderful, really. And it's a pleasure to meet you. So. It's been my pleasure, Kobe. I've loved it. And, uh, and all power to, to, to what you're doing and continuing this going forward and uh, making a difference. Thanks, man. Thank you.